Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Dunbar-Johnson, and as President of International of the New York Times, it is my great privilege to welcome you here um, for this session. Um, I'm really excited about this particular session, which is entitled The Power of Knowledge, Girls' Education as an Accelerator of Climate Action. Um, it shouldn't be lost on anybody that the reason why the Paris Accord indeed became an accord is really testament to the power of women. Because behind the scenes were fantastic women like Christina Figueras, Laurence Tubiana, Rachel Kite. Without them, I don't think the Paris Accord would, would have got across the, uh, the line. So girls' education, empowering girls, is a critical ingredient here we're gonna solve the climate crisis. And um, so I'm delighted that we're having this panel today. It's going to be uh, moderated by um, Katrin Benhold, who is um, our Berlin bureau chief and one of our, our star correspondents. Um, so before they come on stage, I would just like to thank um, Nike, who is sponsoring this session. And I would also like to welcome all of you from all around the world who, who are visiting us virtually. And for those of you that are online, please do submit your questions to the broadcast online. So enjoy the session, and now I'd like to roll a very quick video. Thank you. All kids are made to play. It's innate. And we know that kids who are active do better in every way. They're more confident, they excel in school, and they carry these benefits into their adult lives. That's why at Nike, we invest in play and sport for all kids because an active next generation means a healthier and more equitable future. But four in five kids aren't getting the amount of physical activity they should, and girls are the most likely to be sitting on the sidelines. Gender inequality is a pervasive global issue that prevents girls not just from playing, but also from having the opportunity to reach their full potential at school, in their communities, and in their careers. And this directly and adversely impacts girls' opportunities to lead through this global climate crisis. That's why so many of us across the public and private sector have taken action by empowering girls to be our leaders creating opportunities for the girls in our lives and our communities. We're teaching girls the skills that help them to think on their feet, make their points, and defend their positions without apology. We're role modeling and coaching girls to be strong, smart, and bold. And we're ensuring girls have the knowledge, resources, and skills to live healthy lives with access to meaningful educational opportunities. Each of us can and must help girls reach their potential. It starts with play and culminates with playing a role in strategizing solutions for all people and our planet. Because girls, the future generation of female leaders, are critical in our race against climate change. Welcome, everybody. For 26 years, world leaders have been talking about how to save the planet. These leaders have been overwhelmingly middle-aged men. They haven't delivered. We're in 2021, and only 23 countries in the world have a woman either as a head of government or as a head of state. 23 out of 197. The climate failure is male. And at the same time, some of the most prominent and passionate leaders on climate are young women. We know them by their first names, Greta, Malala, Vanessa, Leah, Luisa, to name just a few. We're very priv privileged to have some of them with us today to talk about something that's rarely talked about, the link between climate and gender. We're going to talk about how to harness education 
to get more young women a seat at the table. Because as every woman in this room knows, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I'm going to start, if we're going to get our third speaker onto the screen, with Malala. Welcome. Malala does not need an introduction. She was only 15 when an armed gunman shot her in the head on her way back from school because she was advocating for the right of every girl to have an, to ed have an education. Malala, Malala you've, you've since, since become, become the youngest, the youngest ever Nobel, Nobel Peace, Peace Laureate. Laureate. You're, best You're best known for this, for this issue of girls', of girls education. But recently, but recently you have turned your attention to climate change. change. And, I just, and I just want to make the point when you were born in 1997, world leaders, world leaders had already been talking for two years of how to solve this problem. So, so let, me let me maybe start by asking you, how did you personally get into this issue of climate change? First of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk here. And thank you so much to everyone who are here to listen to the voices of uh, girls and young women on the issue of climate change. And I'm really thankful to all young activists for raising their voice and, and reminding leaders that this is a serious matter that we need to talk about right now. Uh, regarding my mission for girls' education, that has not changed. I want to see a world where all girls can have access to safe, quality, and free education, a world where they can, they can learn and lead. But right now, we know that uh, there are many countries and, and many marginalized communities where girls are disproportionately affected by climate change. When we talk about the 130 million girls who are out of school, they, these girls are out of school because of different reasons. And some of the reasons include climate disasters, uh, including displacement because of cl uh, climate uh, catastrophes like drought, like floods. Uh, many of their schools are washed out because of uh, those uh, climate uh, events. And sometimes they lose their home. Sometimes they lose uh, you know, the opportunity to be uh, formally in, in a classroom. Uh, Malala Fund conducted a research on this and it showed us that this year in 2021, up to 4 million girls are at risk of losing their education because of climate disasters. And that number could go up to 12.5 million in, in, in just five years. So we could see an increase as the climate disasters and, and the climate risk increases. We could see more and more girls dropping out of their schools. So climate, uh, gender equality, and girls' education are not separate issues. They uh, are all interlinked. And that's why taking climate uh, change uh, seriously is important to ensure that all girls can have access to safe and quality education that, and that we see gender equality in the world. And we also know that when girls are educated, when they receive safe and quality education, and when they are e equipped with the skills that they need to prepare for a green uh, future, we are in a better place to fight against climate um, difficulties and hurdles. So it, you know, on the one hand, climate change is uh, acting as a barrier in girls' education, but then on the other hand, when we uh, invest more in girls' education and try to find better solutions to that, we can at the same time be addressing the climate issue as well. Malala, when we think about the consequences, the catastrophic consequences of climate change, we don't normally think about girls' education. So this is, this sort, of is sort of taking us one step further after, after the floods the drought, and the droughts and the disasters. What concretely happens? How do the women uh, and the girls end up outside of education? Can you maybe share some of the experiences with us that you've gathered when you met young girls across the world? You were traveling for the Malala Fund in Brazil, for example. Uh, yes, I uh, I have seen uh, you know for instance even even in Pakistan, uh, oftentimes the story that people mention about my fight to education is that of the Taliban. But in 2010, there were floods in our hometown in Swat Valley, and I remember that school day. Uh, we we saw that you know the, the the river water was flowing over the bridges, and we could not even cross the bridges to go to our home. And I had to go and find another bridge and, and just quickly get to, to my house. And this was the story of so many girls on that day. Uh, I think more than 100 schools were affected by the floods. And, uh, and you know, just, just 
coping with cleaning the school buildings and um, ensuring that you recover all the damages and fix the electricity and uh, get back the furniture. These are costly things. And there are some schools which are flooded completely. Uh, so that is just one personal experience that year. Uh, but I have also had the opportunity to meet girls in person. And I traveled to Brazil where I met indigenous girls who Malala Fund is supporting. And, and, and they were fighting for two things. One was education and the other one was land rights. Uh, these are girls who want to protect their traditional tribal lands and they want to uh, fight against deforestation uh, and all the things that are happening that are harming their traditional land. They have every right to protect that. And, uh, and also some of them were saying how, you know, their protection and their land uh, preservation is not prioritized in their community. Uh, and I also heard stories about how, uh, you know, like these girls for them, like education and, and, and their land is equally important. Uh, and, and there are many more stories like that. Manessa, I want to turn to you. You are a climate activist in Uganda. Uganda is one of the countries that has one of the fastest changing climates in the world. Does this strike a chord with you? Have you seen this disproportionate impact on girls and women in your own country up close? Yeah, um, everything Malala has spoken about is something that many girls and many women across the world are experiencing, not just in my country, because uh, I come from a society, and many women come from societies whereby um, specific roles have been decided for women and girls, and in many cases, women and girls find themselves in positions of providing food for their families, uh, collecting water for their families, collecting firewood for their families. So they are always at the front lines when these disasters occur, when farms are washed away. That is hard work of women that is being washed away. And it takes really, uh, it takes a long time for food to be grown on the farm. And it takes a very short time for it to be destroyed by extreme weather. And it is women and you know, girls who have to walk very long distances to collect water for their families in case of water scarcity in the area, especially in the rural areas. So at the time when these disasters occur, women are, you know, at these front lines. A personal, um, you know, experience I can talk about, while I was growing up, girls were never allowed to learn how to climb trees uh, because in a way it would, it would um, I don't know what word I can use, but affect your value or something like that. So, and I think that one of the first responses to surviving a flood is to climb a tree. And in a scenario where many women and girls are not able to climb that tree until you know, the next help comes in, many women and girls face a challenge of, uh, or a risk of dying in a flood, you know, because in certain societies, women and girls are not allowed to climb trees. And to speak about girls specifically, some of them face a risk of dropping out of school if their families are not, you know, some drop out to help their mothers recover their crops or to help their mothers um, collect the water for their families while others drop out because their families are not able to take care of their school expenses. And it was in 2019 when I read an article that was talking about child brides. And it was explaining how in many communities across Africa, when families face the pressure of climate disasters and losing uh, everything because of these disasters, they are forced to, first of all, um, decide on which child is going to continue with school. And there is always a priority of uh, the boys over the girls, and we've seen this over the years. So many girls face that risk of dropping out of school, and worse, some even face the risk of being forced into early marriages. Because when they are married off, their parents expect a bride price a bride price that could come in form of money 
or in form of cattle or any other uh, livestock in general. And this would help them help the family recover from um, these losses because of the climate crisis. And it's also evident that some of the girls uh, choose, they ask their parents to get married uh, because they feel like they have a responsibility to protect their families or to provide. Because we all, I also know that uh, in my culture or in my country, if I'm to get married, my family has to receive bride price. So some girls feel like they have to also take on a responsibility of telling their, you know, their parents that I'd rather get married than see you guys starve uh, because our family has lost everything. So these are you know, things that are exacerbated by the climate crisis. And one thing I've really seen is that in any form of a crisis, the inequalities that girls and women face are only increased. Even during this pandemic, thousands of girls have they face a risk of not going back to school uh, because of the, the, what has happened, fam families losing jobs or uh, their businesses cracking down or uh, girls getting pregnant. I read an, um, an article that was talking about over 23,000 girls getting pregnant in a certain region in my country during this pandemic. So I think when it comes to the inequalities that girls and women face, in case of any form of crisis in a community, be it the climate crisis, be it the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, be it uh, a community conflict, uh, there are inequalities that they already face will only be made worse, yeah. And what's so striking about hearing these accounts is not only that women and girls are disproportionately affected and the most vulnerable, uh, probably also the one with the lowest carbon footprint on average um, in, this, in those countries, you of course have a global injustice of you know, four out of the five most affected countries by the consequences of climate change are in Africa. And yet, as you pointed out in your recent speech, you know, Africa is the lowest carbon emitter uh, in the world among all the continents except for Antarctica. So let me take it over to Leah, because the one thing that has shifted fairly recently is that these catastrophic consequences of climate change are no longer conveniently confined to these faraway developing countries. They are now right here at home with us. I covered the floods in Germany where almost 200 people died this last summer. Uh, in, at the west, on the west coast of the United States where you're from, uh, these incredibly high temperatures and wildfires killed hundreds of people. Um, climate change is with us. And I'm wondering, Leah, whether you could speak a little bit about your climate activism in the United States of today and to what extent you are also observing these inequalities within a rich country that we're observing on a global scale. In other words, the most vulnerable in your community being affected the most by climate change. Absolutely, and I'd like to start with the fact that the environmental justice crisis has been happening for quite some time for indigenous communities in the now called United States and for black and brown communities. But we are seeing a sense of urgency right now, quite transparently, because I believe that a lot of white Americans are saying, we are now going to be impacted by this crisis. However, that's really concerning because communities of color in the United States have been living with higher concentrations of air pollution in their neighborhoods for decades. Dr. Robert Bullard, so many incredible environmental justice leaders that I look up to have been doing these studies since the 80s. And the Environmental Protection Agency has known about this inequity. So I wanted to start there. The environmental justice crisis has been happening for a long time. And right now, there's a sense of urgency about a hypothetical future that could impact, quote unquote, all of us but we need to consider who is being impacted now and who has been impacted for a very long time. 
However, thankfully, conversations about intersectional approaches to environmentalism have been increasing, and people are starting to dig into that environmental justice data. They're starting to turn to indigenous communities in the United States to learn about their um, land management practices and also how they've been impacted by environmental injustice. So that does give me a lot of hope. You know, it's interesting. Um in June last year, you uploaded this protest graphic on Instagram that read, environmentalists for black lives matter. I'm really curious about this um, intersection of identity and you know, the environmental burdens and costs that people carry. Can you talk to us a little bit? Because I think in our minds, perhaps wrongly, um, the environmental movement was often perhaps a white movement in our minds. And I feel like you're, you know, you're proving that that's changing, and I would love to hear more about um, how you know, people of color and black communities are being empowered by this, and to what extent it resonates with them, uh, among all the other things that are fights that they're fighting. What I'm doing is just carrying on the work of my ancestors and the people who came before me, because yeah, there is a common misconception that the environmental movement is a white movement, and maybe people start at Earth Day, um, however, we have to turn to the civil rights movement in the United States starting in the 60s. And then we turn to the 70s and we see this Earth Day movement and the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and a largely white-led environmental movement that was very intentional. That movement appropriated so many of the successful tactics from the civil rights leaders and excluded them. And then when we turn to the 80s, you can ask the question, why did we have to have an environmental justice movement in the 80s that often is not taught in environmental programs around the world, but there was a BIPOC-led environmental justice movement happening in the 80s because they said we were left out of the Earth Day movement. We were left out of the environmental movement. And when we turn to 2021, it's happening again. It's happening when incredible activists like Vanessa are continuously being cropped out of photographs and our countries and our neighborhoods are being cropped out of environmental conversations. So I want to say again, we have always been there. And it's time for us as environmentalists to look back at our history, learn our history, learn about Hazel M. Johnson, the mother of environmental justice. When you say the words climate justice, learn about the BIPOC women, the indigenous women who created that terminology. And every time intersectional environmentalism comes out of your mouth, I hope you remember Kimberly Crenshaw, and I hope you remember the incredible BIPOC environmental justice leaders because they've been there. And that's the work that I'm doing, carrying on their work. So this is a great segue back to you, Malala, because it's about education, and it's about the blind spots in our education, certainly in the West, but probably globally, and the role of women and the way that women are cropped out of the picture, as you put it, so much in history in pretty much every sector you look. Um, so Malala, in terms of the actual power of education to empower girls and women, what does that look like? And in terms of you know, turning this into action, are you, have you put this before world leaders? Have you been lobbying certain governments? Have you talked to um, authorities about you know, new syllabuses that can deal with these challenges and get women on board and educated so that they can have a seat at the table? First of all, I just want to say that um, activists like Vanessa and Leah are leading the climate movement. It is the young people, especially young women, who are the voices of the climate movement. And that gives hope to so many people. And um, we know that Climate change is a global issue, but the consequences of climate change are not equal. Some of us are more vulnerable to the climate disasters than others. Marginalized communities, especially women and girls, uh, minorities and, uh, and indigenous communities are more vulnerable to climate disasters that are affected the most. Uh, so that's why it's important that we become sensitive to gender, we become sensitive to um, to other identities that could be causing uh, th this problem. So, you know, treating climate change and gender equality and girls' education as separate issues is not doing justice to the cause of creating a fairer and better and cleaner world for all 
of us. It's important that we take these issues seriously and see the link between all of these. Uh, I have been advocating for girls' education since age 11, and the message has been always the same. We continue to ask leaders to invest in the education of girls. There are 130 million girls out of school, and there are millions of girls every year at risk of losing their education because of climate disasters. Uh, so it's important that girls are given education and then that they're given quality education, which is green gender sensitive education, that they are equipped with the skills that they need to prepare for a greener and a better future. Uh, and our world leaders also just need to listen to the voices of young young activists. They need to listen to Vanessa, they need to listen to... Well, maybe we'll, we'll bring Malala back in as soon as the technical hiccup has been fixed. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, we are talking about girls' education and women's education and that I don't believe this is an issue at all in the conference center overall. You, you froze just now, Malala. Um, I was just saying, I don't think girls' education and a sort of gender-responsive climate education is on the table over in the blue zone where the leaders are meeting. Are you confident or are you seeing any response um, in the places that you've, you know, mentioned this, this idea. I mean, do you think this is something that certain leaders are open to? And just as a matter of interest, do you think that women leaders might be more open to it than male, leader, male leaders? I think women leaders uh, often do better than male leaders, and studies show that. Uh, but I think any leader can change the world. Any leader can make this world a better place for all of us if they carry the commitment within their hearts. And anything is possible in this world. We can make change happen if we carry that will inside us. So I ask all world leaders, from Biden to Boris to, uh, you know, to anyone who's there at, uh, at, at this table to take climate change seriously and to ensure that they take immediate actions to protect our planet and they should not ignore the role of gender equality and girls education in addressing the climate change you know the the, the sort of rift between gender and you know i mentioned earlier that we have so few women leaders in the room over there um in that generation is, is striking but you know the generational rift is the other thing of course it's older people making decisions today on the climate and it's really your planet uh, in terms of you know, being the generation that will be living the longest with the consequences. Um, I don't know if you, if you heard or were aware that some of the leaders have been kind of trying to be responsive to young activists and protests. And we've been hearing things like, you know, we hear you. Justin Trudeau said, you know, we must do better. Uh, do you buy it? To me? Both of you. <laughs> No. <laughs> you want to Maybe that speaks for well, itself. <laughs> well, um, we've, we've received so much of that, and we've, I think almost every activist has been called inspiring, and <laughs> almost every activist has been told that they're going to change the world. But I think that when leaders do that, they are giving us the responsibility to save the world and like that they're, they're, they're making us responsible if it doesn't go well then we failed to do it so i think when leaders do that usually i send back the responsibility to them because i may be able to go to the streets and strike or protest but i am not in the negotiation rooms right now so i don't really buy it when um, leaders praise young people for activism. What about you, Leah? There are youth activists that are being locked out of the rooms, the negotiation rooms are not being invited, and there are youth activists, BIPOC youth activists, who are being removed from the grounds at COP. So until youth, especially BIPOC youth, have a presence in these negotiation rooms, then I don't really buy it. I'm going to open it up to questions pretty soon, so get them ready uh, in your minds. Uh, I did want to just hit on one other thing that I found as a kind of old school feminist myself, myself you know, showing my age. Uh, I'm just a feminist, but a lot of the young women I speak to refer to themselves as eco-feminists, or you know, they very much stress this intersection between environmentalism 
and feminism. So I would love it, Leah, if you, um, because you know, your uh, kind of online climate justice community actually uses that term, intersectional environmentalism, I would really love it if you could talk to us a little bit about ecofeminism and what it means uh, to young women today. Absolutely. So ecofeminism as a practice has roots um, with environmental activists in India. And it's such a beautiful concept and it means a lot of different things for different people, but it is exploring that intersection between gender and environment. Um, some people take it to a more kind of cultural or spiritual route because there are a lot of um, in biblical texts and religious texts, there's a lot of talk about women and earth or mother earth and things like that. But more commonly nowadays, a lot of people are kind of combining intersectional feminism, which explores feminism and race and identity and all these things. And um, I guess the alternative would be non-intersectional feminism that unfortunately can be a bit harmful because it doesn't consider the way that race or sexuality might impact someone's womanhood. So intersectional feminists are looking at all those different identity aspects and using that to become stewards for the environment. So I think it's really cool, it's evolving, and I'm excited for where it's going to go. So can you be a feminist without being a kind of environmental activist today in this moment we're in? You can be, but I think it's even better if you care about the planet. And I think if you care about gender equality, then you probably care about the planet too because they're all really interconnected. And what's really cool is that most environmental leaders are women. And even when you look at the youth climate movement, most of the leaders are women. So that's why girls' education is also really, really important. I'm going to throw it open to the audience. Um, so when I pick you, please be fairly brief and concise and identify who you are so we get as many questions in as we can. There we go, a gentleman in the third row. Hi, everyone. Uh, Giacomo Hurst here. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering if I could hear a little bit more about the perspectives that women and girls bring to the climate movement that would otherwise not be present. Did, did you hear that? No. The last bit was hard to understand. The perspectives of? Yeah, that, it's a good point. Maybe you can crystallize uh, for us a little bit the perspectives that women and girls bring to these climate talks. I mean, are there, in some ways maybe, it would be interesting to get the three of you, if you can, it's, it's a tough question, but could you sort of articulate what you would like these guys to take into account? If you were to tell them one thing as they're walking into that blue zone in the morning, what would it be? What would be the perspective you'd like them to consider? Uh, Malala, maybe I'll start with you. I think, um, you know, firstly, I, I think the voices of women and every community are important at the table because, you know, why is it sort of the default that it has to start with men and then everybody else has to join in and find what is special that they bring onto the table. I think regardless of how women are connected to this issue, women's voices are important anywhere at the table. But then again, there's also that connection between climate change and gender equality and girls' education, whereas, where again, we need women's voices at the table. Uh, most of the time when you talk about addressing climate change, you know, they just, they just talk and talk and talk and, uh, they rarely make any big commitments, so it's important to have the voices of young women who can remind them how important it is to invest in girls' education, how crucial it is to uh, ensure that women's safety is, uh, is, is taken seriously in terms of the climate disasters that we are facing and how vulnerable women and girls from marginalized communities can be to those, uh, to those uh, disasters that, <clears throat> that we face. Uh, and there are so many other points. I'll you know hand it over to Vanessa and and Leah now. But you know women's voices have to be at the table where decisions are made. And if that is not done, then at least world leaders should listen to the voices of women and girls out on the streets. Vanessa, what is the one thing and the perspective that you'd like these these guys mostly to take into account? I think I don't really have one specific thing. I think uh, there's so many things and. These are things that we've really been talking about the whole time. 
But if I am to summarize it, I would say rising for the people and for the planet and listening to the voices, especially the voices who are, which are mostly impacted by the climate crisis. And when it comes to, you know, women and girls, for leaders to acknowledge that loss and damage is here with us now, and loss and damage is affecting very many people across the world, uh, especially very many women and very many girls. But since we're now uh, talking about education, uh, it would be to invest in education of girls, uh, women empowerment, because this is, uh, this is something that would reduce already existing inequalities that many girls and women face. Uh, this is something that will build resilience of individuals, resilience of families, re resilience of communities and the world at large. And uh, this is something that will reduce greenhouse gases all at the same time. Because Project Drawdown lists 100 things that we can do to you know, reduce greenhouse gases. And ranked number five is education and family planning. So this is a solution that will do all different things at the same time. And I think that it's a solution that will give all of us a lifeline. And I, I would love leaders to, you know, to get that and for them to know that we cannot have climate justice if more than half of the world's population is left behind. Many times women are able to get to, the, to those rooms through education, you know, or through being empowered and that will mean investing more in empowerment of women and education of girls. And it's also important to note that the girls uh, who are most likely not going to be able to go to school or to finish school are from the communities that are already on the front lines of the climate crisis. And it is these very communities that didn't cause the climate crisis. And again, it is these very communities that are continuously erased from the climate conversation. So I think I would tell them that and more. <laughs> Leah, do you have anything to add? I think you guys need to make a list and we need to send it over. Yeah, that was so We've got another week. I was, I'm just and off. Um, but I would say that the exploitation of the planet is deeply connected to the exploitation of people. So marginalized communities can understand the extractive nature of what's happening when it comes to the planet and the climate crisis right now. So because the same systems are at play that allow the planet to be exploited and allow our most marginalized and vulnerable communities to be exploited. So to answer the question earlier, that's why I believe that women and BIPOC and marginalized communities should have a seat at the table in climate conversations because we deeply understand that exploitation and the systems of oppression that are at play and we can offer solutions that aren't there. So that's why I think we should be there. Thank you, Leah. Are there any more questions in the room? I've got one in the front row here. The lady, do you have a microphone for her? Thank you so much, Vanessa, Malala, Leia. You guys are so inspiring. My name is Sierra Quidiquit. I'm a professional skier and a climate activist. Your work, your leadership means the world to me. Um, part of my work as a white activist is to become more intersectional in my work. And I was hoping you guys could speak to the process of decolonizing systems by decolonizing our minds. Thank you. Who would like to speak to that? Decolonizing systems by decolonizing our minds. Does that speak to one of you? 
Yeah, go for it. Hi, Sierra. Um, I would start by saying education is key because learning our history is so important. So like I said earlier, learning the history of the environmental justice movement, learning the history of ecofeminism in India, learning the history of so many incredible BIPOC and indigenous activists from around the world. And when you learn that history, you'll realize that so many climate solutions have been there all along. So infusing your own take on environmental education with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then from that, really figuring out what's going on in your own local community, because chances are there are so many people who are already doing really amazing work when it comes to environmental justice and using your work to amplify. But I would say education is key first, because education leads to empowerment, and that empowerment and education leads to informed action. And informed action is the best kind and most helpful action. That's great. Do you want to add something? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I really agree with Leah when she talks about education. And I also think that this education should... I can speak about my experience in school and how um, the, when we are learning about history, to be honest, I have grown up thinking that the white person is way so superior because of the history, that because of the things that we are learning. So I think we just need a whole mind decolonization uh, here and also in the global south, especially in education and how you know many many children grow up thinking that they are inferior, and it's like. It's funny. It's like when you, when we were young, if you were to see um, a white person walking, um, children would get so excited because this is what was in school. And uh, even growing up, uh, you see if someone sees maybe an, a person walking with a white person, they feel like it's, uh, it's, it's impossible. Like, how did they become friends because white people are so superior so that like that is what we've been told so i think it needs the whole education from what we are being told and what children are being taught in countries like mine probably countries across africa and also um, in the global north i think it's very important and i also think that uh, De decolonizing the system. I can just really talk about uh, climate justice, and you know, to think about some of the some of the solutions that we propose when we talk about climate justice. This is something that I've already spoken about, but I, I think it's really important to say it again. And it's about you know maybe corporations or leaders you know, putting maybe tree planting campaigns. But in the process of um, putting these tree planting campaigns, uh, many communities, many indigenous people are losing their lands. So I think that that is a climate solution coming in the form of colonization and grabbing of uh, the lands of indi indigenous communities. And also, you know, uh, electric vehicles, People find them very fancy. But many times, uh, the manufacturing of these vehicles means exploitation of so many women, of so many children in certain parts of the world. And those are things we, uh, we never hear people you know, talk about. And I think that's still keeping us in a, you know, a colonized system, because the global north can freely and easily transition, you know, from using diesel or petrol engine cars to electric vehicles at the expense of, you know, many girls or women working in specific mines and being exploited. So I think that is something to also think about um, when it comes to climate justice. And also the, the issue of uh, climate finance, uh, almost, more than 70% of climate finance that is going to come to developing countries that didn't cause the climate crisis 
is coming in form of loans. And it means that, you know, these countries, our countries, are going to just have more and more debt being added to already existing debt. So we, we have this burden of paying back this money for something that we did not cause. So I think it just needs a whole education of, um, you know, people understanding uh, what decolonizing the mind is and also decolonizing climate solutions. Yeah. And one thing I will say before I take the next question <laughs> is that one important solution might well lay in something that you guys are already doing, which is this global networking. The fact that you know each other, you're, you're connected. You're connected with Greta, you're connected with Malala. I mean, you can actually devise telling a joint history that is true uh, rather than having these competing histories that pick whatever it is that is convenient in, in a particular national context. I think that is a very important um, aspect of this global uh, movement today. I would like to take a question from the back of the room, which has been neglected by me. OK, there's somebody waving. <laughs> You've got my attention on the left. Yes. Uh, hi, Malala. Uh, Vanessa Lea, thank you so much for everything. I'm a content creator from India. And my question is, I often get told that I'm too smart for my own good when I say I'm a feminist, and especially as I'm on my way to being an eco-feminist, even by my, my parents, my brother. So my question is, what is an easy way that I can explain this conversation to them and have some change at home and around me and for my audience, most of which are girls who don't get to go to school, whose parents get them involved in housework or get them married too soon? Thank you. That's a big question to be answered in about a minute and a half, Malala. Uh, I would say, you know, be, be proud that you are smart and, and women and girls are smart and climate activists are smart. So uh, I would be very proud of that. And I think we need. We need the smartness in society, both from men, women, everybody. Uh, and in terms of engaging your community, your family members, it's important to talk in the local uh, context. And uh, you know, like when I talk about climate uh, action and when I talk about girls' education, I, I usually mention stories from my hometown to my family members, and it completely makes sense to most of them. And you know, we don't need to use any jargons or any sort of big you know, fancy words. We just need to un make them understand uh, through stories and through um, and 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 through things that that we value that are part of our culture. And it and it you know makes sense to them. I talk about girls education. I talk about its economic benefits and how it's related to climate change. But when I go to a community house, I tell them that you know when those floods happen, girls are vulnerable and they're more likely to get married before the age of 18. They're when they get pregnant before that age, they are more likely. To, to, to die because of uh, you know, the health risk that they have to confront and because they have seen these stories, so it makes complete sense to them. Uh, I'd hand it over to Vanessa and Leah. We don't have much time left, but thank you for that question. And no, you take it. So I, I am so excited that I was part of this panel. I'm humbled, I'm inspired. I hope you all are by these young women. And allow me to use that word. I do it in the spirit also of my two daughters who are 10 and 13 and were very jealous that they couldn't come with me here today. If there's perhaps in the spirit of a New York Times headline one takeaway from this panel for me here today, it is you cannot be a climate activist today without being a feminist. So maybe that's something we should send over there.